Welcome to another Precision Flyer Repairs video. This one is Anatomy 101 of Gilbert American Flyer Steam Engine. It is in follow-up to Anatomy 101 of Gilbert American Flyer Diesel Engine, which I posted several weeks ago. But before I get underway with this video, I just wanted to say best wishes to you and yours for happy, healthy, prosperous, and safe New Year. I hope 2018 works out to be a great year for you and you get lots of time to enjoy running your S gauge trains in the process. The engine that I've selected to highlight in this video is an American Flyer Atlantic cab number 303. Not for any special reason, there are lots of steam engines. This one happens just to be in the shop and has a kind of interesting story to it. The customer asked me to revive it to good operating conditions so that he can have fun with it like he remembers having fun operating it with his father. The 303 also happens to be the first American Flyer engine that I ever had and it ran in fact under the Christmas tree uh, the year before I was even one year old. So it uh, holds a special place in um, my fondness for American Flyer S gauge as well. But let's get started and I thought I'd start at the back of the engine uh, with the tender. Uh, this tender happens to be hardwired to the engine. Um, there's no way to disconnect it. It doesn't have a four pin plug or some other uh, connector between them. It's hardwired and this is a five wire configuration with one wire coming directly to one of the posts on the smoke unit. Before getting started, you ought to have a wiring diagram for the kind of engine you're looking at and confirm, in fact, that it is correctly wired because sometimes uh, they may have been worked on since the factory first assembled it and potentially not wired correctly in the process. So that's always a good place to start and make sure of. This tender like most of them is uh, pretty basic in what components it presents to you. This is the forward truck, this is the back or rear truck. Uh, metal wheels are on opposite sides to pick up power from one rail versus the other. That is then conveyed through the metal axles to these leaf pickup springs and then that conveyed through to the top of these rivets onto which the um, wiring then gets soldered. It's especially important that the insulating washers be intact and in good condition and equally that the shoulder or insulated bushings be in good condition along with the rivet that holds those insulators in place and the leaf spring firmly to the bottom of uh, the truck. If not, you risk getting a short circuiting between the um, power from the rails and the sheet metal chassis and you really want to have the truck isolated and insulated uh, from the sheet metal and only passing power through to the top of the rivet and the wires that are correctly soldered to those. This tender happens to have a very lightweight shell attached to it with four screws, which is pretty commonly the means of attachment. The early sheet metal tin plate tender shells are sometimes held on uh, with twist tabs, and you have to be careful how often or hard you twist those tabs because they can break off. Other shells, like on the Northern, have more than four screws, but again, this video is not to give you a detailed dissertation of what you may find with any variation of Gilbert American Flyer steamer, just generally what the different components are and what they're called. This tender weight helps give stability to the tender, also contact with the rails because the tender shell is so light. The reverse unit um, is one that you'll find in many engines. It's a four position one in this case, the early type, not the two position later models. Um, this one happened to have fingers that were worn through requiring then that the uh, reverse unit be disassembled 
new fingers installed, the drum cleaned and polished, and everything made to work in good order. Um, the pressure that those fingers exert on the drum is very important. It needs to be adequate enough for good contact, but not so much so that it's hard work for the solenoid to advance the drum and you have to have the uh, power turned up to a high voltage for it to actuate. It should be able to move the drum at less than 11 volts measured on the railhead, uh, ideally more around 10. This tender also has a drawbar connected to it with a um, bushing and a washer and a rivet. This one, when it came to the shop, had a makeshift screw connecting the two, which threw the geometry of the drawbar off considerably. Um, I've replaced that with the correct components here so that now that all lines up and pivots and is insulated the way it ought to be. This tender also has a knuckle coupler. Uh, the knuckle coupler ought to be level in um, the way that it sits flat relative to the rails and such that the weight when it drops is a 32nd of an inch above the rail heads when you view across the rails. The um, tender is pretty much made up of those things. Um, one thing to be mindful of that I forgot to mention is that the wheels be properly gauged that the distance between them um, be what it ought to be so that it makes good contact with the rails and cleanly navigates through turnouts, curves, and straight tracks. The pressure of these springs on the axles ought to be such that it's continuous through the whole travel of the axle in the side frame, but not so much pressure that it actually creates drag and extra work for the engine that it slows it down in the process. Moving forward then up into uh, the engine itself, um, we have this one, I have this one assembled. Again, this is a work in process, the tender being finished and the engine now being uh, ready for disassembly, but I thought I'd take this opportunity with it completely apart to show you the components. Uh, at the head end of things, of course, is the light bulb. Typically, this needs to have its lead wires unsoldered for the chassis to be dropped out, but the Atlantic has a single cast plastic body with a closed front smoke box, so the light bulb is held in place with a bracket and it drops out with the chassis intact. Um, the most important part of the engine, at least in my opinion, is its foundation, and that's its chassis with its drive wheels, axles, drive gear, and if it's choo-choo and smoke equipped, the choo-choo um, gear. There are very important aspects to this that need to be present. One is that the drive wheels all need to be correctly assembled such that the components fit correctly and are aligned correctly, um, that the wheels are true so that they spin straight and maintain proper clearance with the frame. If these rims touch the frame, then there can be some short circuiting and erratic performance as the result. Um, the chassis also ought to not have a lot of play in it, that these axles don't move too much uh, and aren't worn too badly. When these wheels are not assembled correctly, it can really throw off the smoothness and the speed and the consistent performance of the engine. When they are taken apart, they break down into three components that I've shown before. In the center of it is the hub through which the axle then goes. Around the hub is the white plastic insulator and around the plastic insulator is the metal rim. Now to drive all of these components apart you ought to use the correct tools so that you're as squarely as possible separating them. If you disassemble or reassemble them on angles you can cause damage to them in the process. Uh, I have made the tools that I use to take these apart precisely and I have invested in wheel cups that enable me to uh, assemble these correctly as well as an arbor press to get a good level press and consistent pressure applied in the process. The wheel needs to be assembled 
particularly with the depth of this hub into the assembly of the insulator and the rim in mind because on the bottom of the hub is an offset and that offset determines the distance off the frame that the rim will spin and that clearance needs to be adequate again so that the rim is not at risk of touching the frame but the hub also has an offset on the front and that offset on the front is designed to help the connecting rod clear the white insulator when the wheels are in motion so a, an important part of reassembling these is to be precise in the way that all three components match and the depth to which they are inserted into one another another important aspect then of um, the chassis is the quartering of the wheels uh, this chassis happens to be quartered in what I call the forward or advanced quartering configuration where the left side is at nine o'clock the right side that we'll look at next is at six o'clock um, they can sometimes be found to be quartered in um, the rear position so the left sides at three o'clock and the right sides at uh, six o'clock if they're quartered that way of course these don't show up that way because they're not um, and either one works I've just found that uh, I prefer this configuration the nine o'clock six o'clock I also have the uh, quartering jig that makes that the result of using that tool um, and it's important to check the quartering when you have a steam engine apart because um, it needs to be correct for one thing and it needs to be the same from wheel set to wheel set I actually had a northern in where some of the wheels were quartered to 87 and a half degrees and some of the wheel sets were quartered to 90 um, the important thing is that they're all quartered to the same value and uh, you don't mix quartering but also I've had engines come in where they simply aren't quartered correctly at all and uh, that has a lot to do with how smoothly and um, consistently the engine will perform the choo-choo gear this stud needs to be inserted um, the correct distance so that there is some play but not excessive play the drive gear on the axle which is this gear here uh, needs to be centered on the axle and um, the whole thing I prefer to have clear of any old grease particularly uh, on the drive gear chooch gear and armature worm gear but as well behind the wheels because when it's behind the wheels it can act like a brake and drag the spinning of these wheels when the engine gets put into motion so that's the harder foundation of the engine then we have the smoke unit which goes on top of the foundation uh, different types this one's the early two chamber there's a chamber on the top and a chamber on the bottom it's good to check the attention of these um, screws assuming that you have a smoke unit that works well this one happens to measure out at 46 ohms with a five wire configuration you want a smoke unit in the range of 35 to 52 and a half ohms uh, 42 and a half is uh, pretty much right in the middle but this 46 ohm unit is producing good smoke this is the cylinder of the smoke unit it should be clean and dry the piston that travels back and forth inside that is available in three materials this happens to be the carbon graphite that uh, the later production American Flyer by Gilbert were used with um, the advantage of it assuming you have a nice fit is that while it's traveling within the piston it's self lubricating the piston in the process the early Gilbert units came with metal pistons and um, while the cylinder and piston should first be cleaned a light oiling of the metal ones can help uh, the third type of material these pistons are available in is Delrin plastic and they work quite well I don't recommend greasing choo-choo pistons where you might get a tighter vacuum created and a force of air you are also creating resistance for the motor to have to work harder pushing that piston in and out of the cylinder that's greased and I like to use them uh, dry this is the field 
that surrounds the armature. The armature spins within it. These are the brush caps which go on the end of the brush tubes to hold the brush springs and brushes in place. The armature is shown here. Um, it has three segments. The continuity between those segments should be measured. The resistance between those segments should be confirmed as being within spec. The worm gear is shown here. It is machined out of the shaft of the armature and that should be free and clear of old uh, grease and lubrication as well. The Brush tube housing is what's shown here. These brush tubes should be intact, uh, not loose or able to spin. Um, the rear armature bearing should be intact and aligned correctly. And also check to make sure that it is not worn excessively. It is, if it is worn excessively, this should be extracted and a new one put in with the proper alignment um, so as to have uh, a good free spinning shaft uh, of the armature, but not with a lot of slop in it. A felt oil wick gets inserted back here and lightly oiled with light oil so as to keep this lightly oiled but not excessively because you don't want oil from that spinning process to get on the armature. That brings up the subject of thrust washers. Typically in the front, there is a 5,000th uh, thrust washer when there is an oil splash guard like on this armature. There is none on the old ones where there is no splash guard. And typically in the four position on the armature, there's a 20,000th washer. You can play around with the number of washers, um, but be careful if you start doubling up brush springs and tripling up thrust washers and stuff to try to get performance out of your motor, you're probably masking a problem and addressing just symptoms in the process. Brushes, this is a shoulder brush of the later type on which a coil spring is um, used. Uh, I think they should be within 90% of a new one to get reused and within a couple of percentage points of each other left to right. To be reused as a pair. This is a brush spring that goes in the brush tube. They should be free of deformation and of the proper length and tension uh, to be used. These are some of the bits um, that go into the connecting rods and uh, drivetrain of the engine. We won't go into a lot of detail there. Um, this is the connecting rod between the wheels and um, this is the push rod that goes from the crosshead assembly of the pilot to those connecting rods. And um, here's the pilot assembly. It has a four wheel configuration and a free traveling pilot truck. And um, this of course is, uh, as I mentioned before, I think the field in which the armature spins and it should also be clean uh, be careful not to get solvents on these windings or on those of the motor for that matter as you can damage the insulating varnish or coating that's on those wires and measured for proper resistance so that it too is within spec. The um, mounting of the engine is typically um, supported in the back by two guide plates and um, some screws. Uh, they can sometimes be stripped or broken. These have required some reinforcement in order to be reused. The date stamping on an engine is many times found uh, under the um, cab, on the ceiling of the cab. This is August 1955. It's always fun to find that. And uh, I like to make note and provide the customer that information when I run across it. Not to be forgotten, of course, is the grease plate that uh, goes underneath the drive gear of uh, the chassis. And I think otherwise, uh, that's a general introduction for you to the major components and parts that go into a Gilbert American Flyer steam engine should you endeavor to uh, take one apart or be in conversation with a repair person as to work that's being done on your engine, um, you can inquire about it now with some knowledge of what they're um, called. One thing I did forget, I'm sorry about that, 
is this is the forward bearing in which the armature spins. It too, like the rear one in the brush housing, needs to be intact and it needs to be checked to see if it's worn too much. If this is loose, it needs to be reinstalled and made to stay intact. If it is worn, it needs to be extracted and replaced correctly with a new one. The uh, correct alignment of the armature within that field such that it spins freely and allows the motor to perform at its best is largely dictated by the condition of these bushings, the one in the front and the one in the back, that help it to have the proper rotational alignment within the motor. So hopefully you've enjoyed this and have found some value from it. If you would like more information, please feel free to visit my website at www.precisionflyerrepairs.com or send me an email at precisionflyerrepairs at gmail.com. Until the next time, be well and have fun running your trains. Thank you.